I'm just welcoming everybody today to the regular webinar slot that we have, but today we have Unveiling Congenital Heart Disease and Comorbidities, Groundbreaking Collaboration Using Primary Care Data. I've just been reading the title, and now I'll just pass it on to James to <laughs> give a better introduction than I've done. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Right. So thanks, uh, Zoe and Bianca. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is James Partington. I've got some introductory slides, and I'll put them up in a moment or two. This is the first of these NHSR uh, events that I've been to, so um, we'll see, see how it goes. I've got a PowerPoint presentation, which is quite short, which I'm going to share. It's really just to provide a bit of background and context and a little prop for me as I'm going through some stuff. I've got a PowerPoint presentation and an article to look at and the Power BI dashboard to look at too. I can see there's still a couple of people joining, so I'm just going to kind of fill the time as best as I can, just give a moment or two for other colleagues to join. Uh, when we do get stuck in, I'm very happy to, to be interrupted. <laughs> so if what I say leads to some questions, just feel free to chip in. If I feel that you're interrupting me too much, don't worry, I'll tell you. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen and just get my uh, introductory slide up while we've still got one or two people joining. So just bear with me while I share the screen. And hope you can see my simple PowerPoint slide that just uh, provides the, the yep. title of my name. So I can see we've still got a, a, a steady drip drip of colleagues joining the event. So I will resist the temptation to launch into my material just for a moment or two longer, give people a chance to join, give myself a chance to have a slurp of tea. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen, so you should be able to see this um, slide which says unveiling congenital heart disease and comorbidities. Uh, that's me, James Partington, and I work for Cheshire and Wirral Partnership NHS Foundation Trust. It's a primarily mental health trust uh, based on Cheshire and Wirral, so uh, near Chester. I live near Chester. Work primarily from home ever since the pandemic. And let's get started. So there's, uh, the first thing I need to do is just give some clearer introductions to myself and Sarah. So Sarah's not here, but uh, but she should be because she's the one who's done most of the work. I, I'll just, I'm just taking the glory moment right at the end. So there's both myself and Sarah, a little pen picture of us both. I work for CWP and I've worked here for uh, 10 years. I'm a statistician by background, um, that was my qualification, and in the first part of my career I worked uh, in the public sector, I worked in the Office for National Statistics and the Department for Education, which used to have some education and employment statistics, and then eventually didn't have any statistics, and I moved into the world of finance and, uh, bis and project management and business intelligence. Uh, James is also qualified, but definitely not a practicing secondary maths teacher. I did a, I had, uh, at one point in my career, I had a, um, the opportunity to train as a secondary maths teacher, uh, which I did, but there were children involved and I hadn't anticipated just how challenging that was going to be. So got my qualification, but uh, decided not to go into teaching. And I've been in, uh, in the NHS ever since. That's me. That's not me, that's John Cleese. Uh, and Sarah Ellison on the right hand side there. Oh, right hand side for me. Are you seeing? No, you won't see her at first. Sarah Ellison, she's been the driving force behind this work on congenital heart disease. I've put this screen grab into the PowerPoint presentation. This is um, uh, provides a bit of context for Sarah, and it's taken from um, the um, uh, an event from Canada. Uh, unfortunately, Sarah didn't get the chance to go to Canada to present. She had to do it remotely. Um, but that's the key. Uh, 
bridging the gap between specialised care and primary care in congenital heart disease, sharing my journey as a patient, nurse and researcher. So Sarah works uh, alongside me in CWP. Uh, she's a nurse um, by uh, kind of a practice qualification, but she's she has congenital heart disease herself, so she's got a you know, strong vested interest. Uh, and really is the driving force behind this work, as I said. So that's the preamble. And uh, let's move on to looking at, uh, at, at the detail. So Sarah carried out some work. It's a long time ago now. It's back in 2013. Uh, a piece of research work looking at um, case notes in GP surgeries. And her primary focus was people with congenital heart disease, what happens to them? Because there was a perception that they can get lost, um, lost to follow up, they call it, lost in the system. And Sarah undertook this review of case notes. You, I've, I've put it in there, but I've put it so small that you can't read it. Uh, she reviewed 412 uh, case notes. She had to knock out a number of people from that because they didn't quite fit the criteria. Um, but she did find that of those with congenital heart disease, a lot have been lost. So the, the data there, just reading this off the screen, uh, 120 children with nine of those being lost to follow up. 209 adults with 95 lost to follow up. So this notion that people are being kind of lost in the system, they've got congenital heart disease, but um, and it's identified at, at, at birth, can, Perhaps I should have said congenital heart disease, heart disease that's, that's there from birth. So what is it that's meaning that these people are, are draw, somehow being lost to, they're, they're falling out of view? So Sarah is quite passionate about this, obviously, because she, she, she herself had CHD and, and has had continuing care. But she, she's a nurse and she understands the way the care system works. And... Uh, you know, what, what more could be done to try to identify these people and raise awareness of the importance of tracking people with CHD and giving them the care they need? So uh, this is the key. The, the, the research, Sarah's review of, of case notes, all the way back more than 10 years ago, led to this finding that people have been lost to follow up, potentially going without support. She had this, this kind of seminal moment, really, which is, Everyone's got a GP, but not everyone's got a cardiologist looking after them. There's a really interesting question about why, why people may have been lost to follow up. So let's just have a slight diversion, just reflect on that. Why do people become lost to follow up? So some patients, that, although it's a lifelong condition and it's identified at birth, some patients aren't aware that it's something that's going to be with them causing them um, potential uh, trouble for the uh, all of their lives. Um, some issues about uh, geography, some issues about just people choosing to DNA. Um, and also an issue with professionals in the system, um, not being aware of the significance of the need to look after people with CHD all the way through their lives. And part of the issue there is not really understanding enough about the comorbidities, which is what I'm going to go on and show you in a, in a bit. So that's a little diversion as to you know what led to people being lost to follow up. But let's let's go back on to the track of thinking about Sarah and the research that she was doing. So she'd done this uh, small scale study of 420 case notes from a GP practice back in 2013, and she had the aspiration um, to try to do a deeper piece of research based on data held by GP practices. So what have we got? We've got a picture of the country there. So Cheshire's just uh, just there for anyone who doesn't know, that's where Cheshire is on the map. Um, you can probably, if you don't know much about Cheshire, you might recognize the, the Chester clock here in this picture on the right hand side. Uh, we've got a very mixed um, demography in in Cheshire, so that's a picture of uh, Runcorn, that's a picture of Ellesmere Port, uh, both on the Mersey and both really struggling with deprivation. But we've also got some um, um, affluent areas within Cheshire. 
So the research ideally will be done using data from GP practices, and that's what we're able to source. Sounds quite simple, this, but I think it was, oh, I said it was groundbreaking in the, in the article title. Um, using read codes to identify people with congenital heart disease in the records held by GP practices. It, it was quite a big deal because up until Sarah started this piece of work, most of the information that we knew about people with congenital heart disease came from hospital records when people had been treated for congenital heart disease as they went through their lives. And the idea that we could take a look at the whole population and identify people with congenital heart disease and test out their comorbidities. Um, it felt groundbreaking and it was groundbreaking. And it led to us writing an article because it's, it's a relatively simple thing that we can do, you know, getting hold of that data and analyzing it. <clears throat> but actually it tells us something that as a society we've been a bit blinded to. Right, so, um, the intention was to take a look at some data from GP practices and sure enough in July 2022 with the help of a number of colleagues across the uh, health economy we were able to extract some data and start to look at it. So what I'm showing you now is data from that piece of work in July 2022 and it just helps to illustrate some interesting um, features about the data of people with congenital heart disease. So, for example, um, we can see something about the prevalence of congenital heart disease uh, in the map on the top right. We've got an age breakdown of people with congenital heart disease here. And um, there's a pattern, which is it's, it's something that's identified at birth and it is a life limiting condition. So you tend to see the age profile for people with congenital heart disease being skewed to the left, um, more people at, your, at younger ages, fewer people at older ages. So there's our age breakdown. It gave us a chance to get some data with, uh, by um, a deprivation decile. Uh, which is always really interesting to see, especially as I said with Cheshire, we know we've got a very kind of polarized um, demographics. And we got some data um, at the level of the PCN, primary care network. So rather than just having Cheshire as a total, we're able to start drilling in. What else have we got? Uh, male and female split, and down in the bottom right, the number of health conditions. Well, that all of this information came from um, uh, an emerging database that was being um, pulled together by our Cheshire CCG Clinical Commissioning Group. So back in the days when we had CCGs, and we've moved on from that now, um, our Cheshire Clinical Commissioning Group was really active in wanting to get good quality population health data um, and the data were pulled, as I said before, from GP practices. The trouble with getting data is it just asks, asks more questions and people want to know more. And uh, when we started to see this data, we were all saying, well, that's great, but we want to drill into it more. We want to find out some more. Can we do more about understanding not just how many health conditions people had, but what those health conditions were? So it takes us to the next slide. Whilst this research was going on in July 2022, another piece of work was taking place, which I've just mentioned here on the slide, the creation of the CIFR database. So CIFR, I've put the asterisk down at the bottom there, combined, it stands for Combined Intelligence for Population Health Action. If you, um, if you, uh, if you stick CIFR into Google, C-I-P-H-A into Google, You'll just see a little bit more about uh, Cypher and uh, what the ambition was. But it's pretty much uh, summarised on this slide here. Um, at the start of the COVID outbreak, there was a real hunger uh, across Cheshire and Merseyside to have good quality information on the health of the population. And in a short space of time, three months, um, 
the, the different clinical commissioning groups across Cheshire and Merseyside collaborated to get this cipher database established. Again, what does it do? It pulls data from GP practices. It anonymizes the data, which allows us to analyze it safely. Um, but it gives us a really rich source of information that will allow us to drill deeper and deeper into the data for people with congenital heart disease. So with the Cypher database based on GP practice data on the one hand and a Power BI front end on the other hand, we've got the potential to carry on analyzing the data in a much richer way. Now I'm just about to um, show you this uh, Power BI application working on the Cypher database, and we'll just take a deeper look uh, at uh, what 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 that's telling us about people with congenital heart disease. And then a bit later in this talk, I'm also going to look at the research article that we wrote that described all of the work that I've summarised so far. And that research article is quite interesting because we had some uh, testing conversations about just how much. Um, statistical rigor and statistical testing to do in the data we were presenting. So I am going to go on and show you the congenital heart disease Power BI application, and I'm going to go on and talk about the research article that we've written about this and some of the challenges that presented. But before I do, I'm going to have another slurp of tea, and I'm just going to pause just to see if anyone's got any questions on what I've been discussing so far. Well, just if anybody wants to put anything in the chat as well, I can relay those if you wanted to do that. The only thing with Zoom is you can't see when people are chatting, and like with Teams, you know, when you see the dot, dot, dot. Okay. Okay, well, the absence of, uh, of, of anyone kind of shouting out, I shall, uh, I shall carry on, but obviously do as uh, Zoe said and stick something in the chat if you want to. So let's have a look now at this Power BI application. Um, so hopefully now you're seeing this uh, Power BI app. So the front, the front end, um, it's got the title congenital heart disease. Uh, Zoe, I might just rely on you. Just give me a nod that uh, you, everyone's seeing that uh, uh, CHD Power BI app. Great. So. There's a number of different tabs. I will look very quickly down each one of these, but let's just have an idea of what this is telling us. So it's got the whole population of Cheshire and Merseyside. It's got the population who have congenital heart disease. Um, we've moved on from read codes. This is based on SNOMED codes. So this is SNOMED codes. So effectively, this is uh, um, when people go to the GP surgery and their conditions are assessed. Um, if someone thinks they've got congenital heart disease and they use the right SNOMED code for that, and that's put into EMIS or whatever system the GP practice uses, that then pulls through into the Cypher database, and that's how we can identify the number of people with congenital heart disease. Gives us a, a rate per 1,000, 8.6 uh, approximately. Nationally, the prevalence of congenital heart disease is uh, 8.2. So did I, did I say nationally? I should have said globally. Globally, the prevalence of heart disease is 8.2 per thousand. So Cheshire and Merseyside's you know, broadly typical. Uh, we get to see some more visuals. So for example, we can see the CHD rates, but now we're starting to see it broken no, no, down. No. Oh, I can hear some uh, noises off. So thanks very much. Uh, we can also see some association with different uh, conditions, different comorbidities. So DEP, angst, HIP, what are all of those? Well, they're all listed in the definitions tab. So DEP is depression, um, aut, autism, uh, angst, anxiety. Got, got the detail down the end there. So already we're just starting to get a sense of what the most prevalent comorbidities are for people with congenital heart disease. But look at this, this is interesting. Uh, diagnosis of CHD by year. We might, uh, we might be expecting something flat or we might be expecting maybe just something with a slight upward ticket. I'm not sure why we would, but look at the 
That's really fascinating. Obviously, the latest data point is only a part year, which is why it's dropping. But it does appear to be increasing exponentially. Um, okay, not with a particularly high factor, but that's definitely not a flat line. So that's that's quite interesting. Unfortunately, with all as with all of this stuff, doesn't tell us why. Just tells us what's happening, and we need to get some clinical advice to work out more about it. So that's a kind of high level overview. What else can we see? Um, very helpfully, we've got this um, checkbox to uh, to isolate out the people with congenital heart disease. So what you're seeing here is the whole um, demographic information for all people um, in Cheshire in Cheshire and Merseyside. When I check the true box. This is now just showing just the people with congenital heart disease. So we've got this feature that we've already uh, mentioned, the, the fact that the age profile is quite skewed to the left, uh, more so than for the whole of the population. Uh, we've got an ethnicity breakdown. We're a, a very um, non-ethnic non -ethnic diverse group up here in um, Cheshire, a bit more so in Merseyside. Um, this is interesting, this index of multiple deprivation decile. Um, anyone with really eagle eyes might have noticed that when we were looking at uh, this slide, this um, deprivation chart, the orange bars here on the left hand side was fairly uniform. Um, this was just for Cheshire. Once we look at the index of multiple deprivation profile looking at the whole of Cheshire Merseyside changes completely with uh, with, with an awful lot more low um, areas of low deprivation and I can highlight that using this uh, using by, by picking out by just pick out Cheshire East and Cheshire West um, Cheshire although it's polarized it has a skew to the right look with um, more affluent areas um, the minute we uh, knock Cheshire out and include the whole of um, the Mersey, uh, the whole of the Merseyside area too, it completely changes the pattern and skews it to the left. So what does that tell us? It tells us what we know already, which is some of the areas up um, that border the Mersey are some of the most deprived parts of the country. Let's have a quick look at the. Uh, let's move on from that and look at the geog geography because this helps to illustrate it. So Cheshire and Merseyside, for anyone who's not familiar with with the area we're in. Um, this promontory is the Wirral, uh, which yeah, stereotypically is um, you know, uh, rich on the left and poor on the right, the, the, the part that borders the Mersey, Birkenhead, Rock Ferry, Ellesmere Port. Um, then we've got Runcorn down by the mouth uh, where the Mersey narrows. Um, areas of um, Liverpool, uh, the Liverpool region, uh, Sefton, Nosley, known to be you know, really poor parts of the country. Um, and Cheshire itself, um perhaps over to the right hand side you've got areas like Alderley Edge, Presbury, Macclesfield, South the South Manchester area. Um always uh, always used to be popular with footballers, don't know if it still is. Um uh, and some of rural Cheshire the, well, you know, this I don't live too far from Tarpley and there's a polo ground at Tarpley. So you've got a real diverse uh, mi mix within Cheshire. And um this allows us to see something about the uh, about the prevalence of congenital heart disease uh, by geography. It allows us to uh, interrogate um, specific areas if we want to. So just zooming in on Nosley there. The reason why some areas will pop up that are outside Nosley is uh, we've got that issue about um, where patients live versus where their, their registered GP is. So you might be seeing some people who live in a slightly different place to where their registered GP is. Um, so all of this is just giving us a fantastically rich tool to analyze in more detail um, what we know about people with congenital heart disease. It doesn't do any statistical analysis on it. It just allows us to understand, uh, to view it with, with more and more um, detailed precision. Let's have a quick look at conditions. Uh, so I said before, um, we we can we can uh, we can use this um, visual to work out 
which conditions are most greatly associated or least greatly associated with people with congenital heart disease. This doesn't list all conditions because we couldn't fit them all in, this, in the Power BI app. Um, there are 15 conditions here that we've thoughtfully gone through and selected. Um, and that's, you could call that a limitation of the Power BI app, which is it's, it's only a selection of conditions and not, not all conditions. And of course, if we want to, we can pick um, a particular subregion of Cheshire and Merseyside, and we can see if that alters the overall picture. Now, one of the things that I'm interested in as a statistician, don't know if you heard my dog just uh, noises off, just getting up and she, she's had enough. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in is, um, is there a statistically significant difference in any of this stuff? And we'll go on and look at that. We'll answer that question in a minute when we look at the research article. Um, but let me just dwell for one more moment on this uh, Power BI app and just you know carry on just going through that and make sure I've kind of shown you everything that it allows us to do. Um, we can we can drill in by GP practice. So uh, the GP practices that you're seeing here um, in this box here where I'm hovering, these are all GP practices in Cheshire and Merseyside sorted by um, prevalence of um, congenital heart disease, um, sorted largest to smallest. So Haslington Medical uh, Center is coming out at the top. Um, actually, that's a really small GP practice, 139 patients, four of them have got congenital heart disease. Um, uh, that's uh, helping to skew their, their profile and give them such a high rate. Maybe if we'd merged that with a couple of other GP practices, it would have been just slap bang in the middle of the list. But that's the nature of data, isn't it? Uh, and scrolling down through, you can you can see really smooth profile actually on this, all the way down to some GP practices with um, no patients um, so, uh, um, registered with them with congenital heart disease. The data are all anonymized in the Cypher database. But there's a link ID, um, which um, the people who run the Cypher database obviously can use that to um, to make connections with uh, actual patient records. Um, but we just get to see the link ID, and that means we're seeing anonymized data. Um, but there is the opportunity to drill in to these link IDs and see um, even more. So we'll pick a patient, drill through. And we can see what age band they're in and what um, uh, what and the I, and the IMD decile of the place that they live. Um, and I can click on some of these buttons and export all of this stuff out into Excel and do some more testing in Excel if I want to. I was really keen to get this added in this um, di diagnosis date. As I said at the start, congenital heart disease. Um, uh, something you're born with, it's, it's, it means the heart's not quite right, not working right. Um, we would anticipate that most people with congenital heart disease have that um, diagnosis identified at birth or shortly after birth. Um, but look at this. There are people, um, now that we drill into the data, we can see people whose diagnosis date was much later in life. And that's a really fascinating find. I haven't anticipated that at all. There's someone here whose diagnosis date was 2042, which is fantastic. But um, but luckily, only one of those. Um, we're always going to get that with data, aren't we? So skipping over that. Yeah, why are, why are we seeing people with a diagnosis date much later in life? Well, I think it might be something to do with this. Um, we looked at it before. Um, after the pandemic, um, um, we definitely saw people going to the doctors less immediately after the pandemic. And then maybe we've seen a bit of bounce back of people going to the doctors with things that have grown, things that have developed. Um, hard to generalize, but my dad was uh, was one of those people who felt it safer to not go to the doctors in the few months after the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, left it too long to have his uh, prostate cancer uh, issues <laughs> sorted. Um, and then he did a lot more work from the from the health system, and maybe uh, with tests, more things were found that maybe had just gone hidden. 
so maybe, and this is me speculating, maybe there's some connection with the fact that we had that period of time where people weren't going to the doctors and then a bounce back where people were going to the doctors and maybe things were being found at that point. Uh, so we've got, and wouldn't it be fascinating to do some work on this and look at the, the ages of people when their CHD was identified and see if we can work and look at their comorbidities and see if we can see a relationship. So maybe that explain why they went to the doctors. And then last of all, within this uh, data set, we've got um, some just some you know, really helpful backgrounds and some useful links. It's a fantastic tool list. It was developed with um, uh, some colleagues who were working in the uh, what, what was uh, the Cheshire CCG and became the integrated um, the ICB, the integrated uh, care board for Cheshire and Merseyside. And it's a great tool. And I am going to go on very shortly and talk about um, working out statistically significant differences in this research article, which we've written on the back of all of this work. But once again, having shown you this tool and tantalized you a little bit, I'm just going to pause and see whether anyone's got any questions on the tool itself before I uh, move on and look at this research article and working out uh, what really interesting patterns we've seen about comorbid comorbidities. There is a question, but not on the tool itself, but on um, congenital heart disease. Does it run in families? And could that be one reason or something to look at, I suppose, when you're looking at the geography, the geographical clustering? Um, does it run in families? Is it, is there a, is it genetically kind of associated? Is, um, mm. Well, this is where it would be brilliant to have Sarah with me, wouldn't it? Mm. Sarah Allison knows all about this kind of stuff. I've got to be honest. I don't know um, whether it whether there's a, a, um, a genetic link and whether it runs. What a poor response from someone who's trying to give you a good quality presentation. But I've got to be honest. It's straying That's into good. the medical side, to be fair. Absolutely. Um, I'm, my guess would be it would be a mixture. And actually, the next comment could actually give some insight into it because more deprived areas tend to have the younger populations. And you're seeing congenital heart disease appearing in those populations as well because of the limiting factor of it. Have you also looked at age standardization rates by deprivation and geography and so on? Ah, well, that, that does actually lead us to go into and looking at the, at the research article that we've done. So we haven't gone as far as age standardized rates, but we have gone as far as just trying to start to do some rudimentary analysis by, you know, um, by age. Um, so let's let's move on and have a look at this article and see which it won't answer all of that all of those questions. Right, so I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint, which just gives me my um, context. So a research article was published in March 2024, basically summarizing all of the work that we've done um, based on that uh, 2022 data set, which I showed you. So um, that's that's all of this stuff. And now the, the Power BI tool that I've shown you has kind of been developed. It's raced ahead, if you like. And, and the article that we published in March 2024 didn't use the breadth of material that's available from that Power BI tool. And that's because we started writing this um, article in 2022 and uh, it took until March 2024 to get it published. So um, I've got a snippet of it here. Yeah, this, this is the really interesting thing for me. There was a, it was a right challenge working out what the focus of the research article should be because on the one hand, there's a very simple point that we wanted to get out into the into the wider world, which was and, and it's all and it's almost so basic that you think it's kind of stating the blind and the obvious, but by and the point is this, by looking at the data held uh, through GP surgeries, you can identify people with congenital heart disease and you can have them uh, in view in order to make sure that you're providing the right care for them as they go through their lives. And, it, and it's almost stating the blindingly obvious, but that, that, as I said before, that simply wasn't happening in the sense that most of the 
Uh, lots of people have been lost to follow up. So lots of people have disappeared. So they've had congenital heart disease that's, that's, that, that ceased to be um, on, you know, in, in view. Uh, it's back to that point where we've talked about people being lost to follow up. So an awful lot of people have just gone under the radar. So um, people, their care wasn't sufficiently proactive for the condition that they had. So the simple message was, look, everybody, by analysing the data held by GP practices, you can learn, you can, you can identify this kind of hidden cohort of people who need care as they go through their lives. And you can provide better care for them if you know about them. And that, that's a, a really simple message that if we could get that, the view was if we could get that out there and, and have other parts of the country also realising the, sig the significance of keeping these people in view and maybe being proactive about their care, that may, might lead to better outcomes, which should lead to better outcomes for them. So that's a really simple message to get out there. On the other hand, uh, a number of people, particularly those with a research bent, were thinking, well, we've got some really valuable information um, now about uh, the comorbidities. And it would be really good if the article could go into some depth to identify these comorbidities and do, you know, work out you know, whether there's a, a statistically significant difference between the population who have CHD having these comorbidities versus the population who don't have CHD having the same comorbidities. And um, that tension, I think, is still there when you read the article because, um, you know, lots of editors all chipping away at it, all, all trying to um, su suggest the, their, their slant and their focus in the article. I think they, these charts illustrate it really well. Both of these charts are in the article. Let me just zoom in a little bit so you can see. I'm calling the charts, obviously, the top ones are table. So what have we got here? The, um, so the, this table is looking at a, a whole series of conditions. Um, a lot of these are conditions of the heart, which you would associate with people with congenital heart disease. And other research that's, pre that's been done previously has shown a clear link between the prevalence of these conditions and congenital heart disease. So if you've got congenital heart disease, um, it's much more likely that you'll suffer from heart failure as you go through your life than if you've not got congenital heart disease. Um, and um, so the desire was to show that and to use some stats. So what have we got here? We've got the raw numbers. Uh, we've got the percentage prevalence. Um, we've got that for both for the congenital heart disease cohort and the non-congenital heart disease cohort. Then we've got a chi-squared test where we're simply using a two by two table and we're plonking in the numbers with and without congenital heart disease with and without heart failure and we're taking um, a chi-squared value based on that two by two contingency table yeah, so for this for heart failure over 400 yeah very high figure clearly statistically significant um, and there was also an interest in producing an odds ratio so um, our proportion of people with that uh, with that illness with CHD over the proportion with that illness without CHD um, and you know, ideally with odds ratios they'll cluster around one if they're far the further away from one they are the more you've got some significant significant difference so again the chi squared value column and the odds ratio column are really saying the same thing just using in slightly different statistical ways they're both saying there's a really really high association between these um, be between um, con congenital heart disease and heart failure so quite statistical and uh, uh, yeah if you've got a statistical bent you might you find that interesting um bar chart <laughs> and um funnily enough with the articles that i will show you in a minute uh, we had produced these tables uh, with all of the odds ratios and the chi-squared values We'd submitted it to the British Journal of Cardiac Nursing for publication. Um, having, having had some bar charts and pie charts in earlier versions of the article, but been advised to drop them because they're a bit simplistic. And, uh, and right at the death, we were about to publish this article and the British Journal of Cardiac Nursing came back and said, do you know what would make this article a bit more lively? Can you just do a bar chart? So 
hurrah for the bar chart um, because it does help to display some complex stuff in a simpler way. Um, and yeah, there's heart failure. So what does this tell us? Prevalence of, um, prevalence in people with without general heart disease, red, you know, prevalence of heart failure, quite low, <laughs> much higher, over three times as high um, for, for people with congenital heart disease. Now, if you're if you're adept in reading the tables, you can you can pick that out from just from reading the odds ratios. You can see they're kind of more than three times as high. But um, through my career as a statistician in central government and now working in the NHS, most of the time the challenge is to explain complex data in simple ways to people who maybe worry about numbers and get a bit fearful of numbers. And uh, I, I, I've got to admit, I'm in the you can't beat a bar chart school here. Although I do like the the, the detail, obviously as well. So let me just flash up for you the the article. Um, it's it, it it covers some of this ground. You've, I've mentioned Sarah and myself uh, as authors. It covers um, it covers this material we've just been discussing. And um, we've got an age breakdown. So have we done anything stand age standardized? No, um, but we have got an age breakdown, which which helps to paint that picture. We did have some really nice <laughs> clustered column charts early on, which showed the population of people with congenital heart disease versus the population people without. I thought you could really see very clearly from that that the that skewing that I described to to, to the left didn't make the final cut and um, I'm not bitter. And then we've got uh, tables which show the different um, uh, uh, the different conditions. Um, we've, I've shown you this already. This was in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, really interesting that hypertension, high blood pressure um, isn't um, statistically significant between the two cohorts. But uh, but then we found some fascinating results that, again, we really didn't anticipate. So a heart um, association, for example, um, between people with um, congenital heart disease and people with autism and people with learning disability. Um, within this, that leads us, that would lead us to some fascinating avenues for further research um, and we stand on the cusp of doing that because we've got the data we've got the data through that power bi tool that i was showing you before um, so you know were we to want to do that deeper dive and explain in more depth the relationships between any of these comorbidities and breaking it down by age or breaking it down by index of multiple deprivation we We've, we've got all of the enablers to allow us to do that. Um, the only reason we've not started is because um, we've exhausted ourselves in getting this article over the line. don't know how many of you out there have written um, articles for public research, articles for publication. Um, probably took 10 times longer and 10 times more painful than any of us as, as, uh, had, uh, had anticipated. Um, the element, the kind of wrangle about should we put a bar chart in, shouldn't we put a bar chart in, do we make it more, more high-end, sophisticated stats, do we make it simple for us to make sure the audience can actually read it? These were really difficult conversations being played out because um, the different people involved in trying to pull this research article together uh, all came from different starting points. All their views were very legitimate. Um, how do you know? How, how do you know what, what your you know, what your audience is going to want to to read? It's, I think the research community were really enthusiastic about trying to make this as sophisticated as as, as possible, and uh, that led to a real tension between you know the desire for sophistication and the desire to get a simple message out there to people saying you need to do more using simple materials. You don't need anything sophisticated to work out your people with CHD and then you can look after them better. 
once you've identified them. Okay, so we've just uh, indulged ourselves in a little look at the uh, research article there. So I'm just going to zoom back out of that. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation. We've talked about this. I did put in the kind of preliminary blurb for today that this was, um, you know, a, a collaboration. What made the collaboration successful? It it really helped to be taking some of this material through the Northwest Congenital Heart Network, and uh, and I've just listed some of the organisations that played a part here. It, it was very helpful indeed to have some big players, some big hitters, particularly from Little Heart and Chest Hospital and Manchester Heart Centre. Um, it it kind of adds the validity to what you know is valid anyway, but um, it doesn't half help to have uh, one or two high profile names or to have the endorsement. And I think it was a really shrewd step to be taking some of this work to in this case, the Congenital Heart Network um, at various steps along the way to just to keep them informed and to see if they've got any comment or constructive advice about which direction. Well, ultimately, some of the most challenging angles were left to the authors of the article to try to work through, you know, how do you determine what, what best to publish? But fantastic to have this uh, range of participants all chipping in with, with advice. Um, to lead to that article being published. That's me at the end now. Should anyone, you know, have any questions and want to come back to me, but don't don't come back to me with, with really complicated stuff. So that takes us through the material I've, I've prepared. But obviously, if there's any more questions in the chat, or if anyone's got any questions that they want to ask, please please do. There was a comment just to pick up on that last question about the inheritance type of thing, or what's it called? Um, there's a better word, and I've forgotten it. But there are sometimes underlying ge genetics, but not always. <laughs> so I just thought I'd add that for the purposes of the recording because okay. it was very helpful. So thank you for the comment. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks to whoever's put that in. That's really useful. Useful to have that. And Makes I wanted, sense. I wanted to pick up on a question, kind of technical, and it's kind of not. Um, it probably does fall into the technical side. You had great collaboration between your local areas, and I think that amazing work is is from collaboration. How easy do you think it would be to try and give the processes to collaborate to other analysts across the country or the countries to the UK? Because one of the things with NHSR community is what we do is we, we just like everything to be open. And not the code, not the data, sorry, I get them mixed up, not the data, which I'd never send out, I'd never get that bit of a mix up, but um, your practices and your processes, because I guess with more areas being involved doing similar work, you've got bigger numbers to work with and some areas to test out those questions of say these correlations between certain um, either comorbidities or certain factors of people's lives. Yeah. How do we get that out to other analysts and data scientists? Because you've done an immense amount of work uh, and it's like that beginning bit I'm, I'm focusing on. No, exactly right. And that, that takes us back to this, um, to, to this, to the article. And um, so let's just call it up again. Because in a way, this, this article could have just, you know, you could have taken the, the method and, and, and simply, Always get a bit hung up on the on the sophistication of the language here, and so I'm just sharing that again. Um, you know, I read this and I just think that it's too it's it's worded a bit stuffily. You know, basically what we did was we got hold of the data, from the GP practice data, using in in our case locally the the Cipher database process. Maybe there are other processes um, around other parts of the country that would allow this process to be really easily um, replicated. The, 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 on, the only quibbly bit in there is the SNOMED codes in the sense that um, someone, Sarah, has gone through and looked at the list of SNOMED codes and picked out the ones that are associated with congenital heart disease. Once that's been done, um, this is a method that's completely replicable, scalable, 
uh, at no cost, well, assuming that there is such a population kind of health database in, in the local area already. Um, and, and you worry that in the desire to make it all sound all learned, <laughs> you somehow somehow the, the simplicity of that message gets lost and actually go back to the fact that there are, there are some drivers to, to not want to make it sound simple because they want to make it sound sophisticated and complicated. Um, Sarah has um, taken this to NHS England, well, Sarah and I and others have taken this to NHS England and said, look, this is replicable, um, you know, just bang the drum and see if you can get other parts of the country to so um, the article talks about the way we've done it and we've been working through NHS England to try to kind of sell it, if you like, and say, yeah, this is, you know, here's a method that anyone can, can use. So those are two ways we can try to do it. And maybe this um, seminar might be another way, it might drop, drop the seed in. Um, and, and I think as well as people go about their professional practice, so those uh, organisations I listed, you'd like to think that as they're involved in other national networks and things, they can... They, they too can bang the drum. Um, it's, it, life's not not easy like that, though, because there's an element of um, perverse incentive to kind of, you know, well, we've done this work and we can get credit for it. And, but let's let's not dwell on that. Let's let's focus on the desire to to. to... That's quite an academic thing, isn't it? So <laughs> when it comes it. to the NHS, uh, we rarely publish. I mean, I've only been involved in a couple of published articles, and it's just. I'm interested in the stuff that doesn't work and publishing that, but obviously there's publishing bias, which if you're in yeah. that world and that's your metric for your yeah. work. But um, yeah. a couple of us, including me, definitely, quite interested in the SNOMED codes. If that's possible to share or point to, I'd like to point towards that or help publish it through our NHSR system so that at least then we've got that code list. Yeah, so... Um, uh... Uh, definitions of uh, CHD, and uh, let's just zoom in a little bit. So we've just got a little bit of stuff there in that one, but I think if we go to this de definitions page, let's see what it says about it. Um, SNOMED codes were used to identify the conditions. Uh, the codes were either defined nationally by our NHS England digital data sets or locally by clinical experts. What actually happened in practice, as I say, is my colleague Sarah, who we've talked about throughout, just um, worked her way through the SNOMED codes and made sure we'd identified them. Um, so a breakdown of the codes used in the dashboard is available via the link above. Um, okay, not sure about a link above. Um, so I will um, take that as an action to just send, is that just back on to, to you, to me, Yeah, and I will share that. Um, possibly through something called the Health Inequality Notebook, uh, which is something that we've published through GitHub, because I've got a code list in there for things that are related to health inequalities. So this is an act, you've got health inequality kind of touches everything really, yeah. every particular area. So it's it's our knowledge repository of everything that we've got. Or I'm a bit of a magpie for things like codes and SNOMED codes and read codes or ICD-10. They're quite laborious to go through to make sure that you got the right ones because you could you can quite easily yeah. get things tagged in there that are no longer used or um, not in the right area. They're just you know naming conventions. Yeah, there is a SNOMED reference link. Someone says at the top of the page, but if we get that sent through, I'll certainly link sure. to it. And then it's always a nice way of publish uh, publicising rather than publishing NHSR things because. We publish all the time, but we don't go through journals, so it makes it a little bit easier. And if we have any corrections at all as well, that's what we're interested got, in. I just love the fact that oh, I've been yeah. living, I've been living and breathing this thing for two years, and um, <laughs> someone's really helpfully pointing out stuff that I haven't noticed with it. Absolutely. Name. It's good. Um, so SNOMED codes. Whoa. Yeah, Look at that's it. the kind of thing that. I'm sure there's a couple of people in the audience and maybe even on the recording and go, oh, yes, because that's an immense amount of work I, just to okay. double check everything. Uh, and uh, and just to emphasize the point here that that's the SNOMA codes, not only for congenital heart disease, but for the 15 or so um, other comorbidities that we have identified as being 
associated with CHG that we wanted to. Um, oh yes, brilliant. So um, we'll have this as an Excel file. So I'll make sure we set. Oh we yeah, provide. that'd be wonderful. Thank and you. Thank you to the person who spotted the link. Yeah, fair it's, it's a fellow code uh, enthusiast. <laughs> just say because that it was a fantastic presentation i just want to say thank you if there are any other questions please do say we've got a few more minutes but just to say thank you so i really enjoyed that and at the very end it was, it was a highlight for me some codes they don't have to be in code i love code of r and python and sql but you know we have our own sort of medical codes as well and i get very very excited yeah. about those too okay yeah. just to Project congratulate awesome. you on the immense Project amount of work uh, oh thank you uh thank you for that yeah. um uh, the two years on and off, of course, um, but uh, I think for Sarah, she's kind of lived and breathed this for um, pro probably feels like far too long now. <laughs> and I hope that that's the thing, because it could take a lot of energy to get these things out there. And hopefully what will happen is that people will pick up on that and keep running with it, because it's not something that we want just to be done and be finished with and then yeah. nothing changes. So hopefully with this webinar and maybe future ones if people are inspired to we can carry on with that kind of work and sharing our knowledge and approaches so i think it's uh, it's getting to kind of lunch time if people sort of put off to come here or back to work i guess so just want to say thank you so much again and yeah. um i will stop the recording i think i have the power to do so